I'm going to kick things off with talking about the problem of back pain and probably more importantly what we can all do to work together to help solve this problem. So to no one's surprise, we have a crisis of pain in this country. You open up any magazine, any newspaper, and you'll see about uh, reports on back pain, headaches, neck pain, fibromyalgia, neuropathic pain. But you don't even need to open up a newspaper. You can just look to your left, to your right, talk to a friend, a loved one, a family member, and we'll see that this is an epidemic of pain in this country. And in fact, what we're faced with is based on the IOM report that we put forward, about one in three Americans suffer from some degree of chronic pain in this country. Now that ranges from people like my father who played a lot of competitive sports in his younger years and had a lot of injuries, who has chronic pain, but who self-manages. He won't see a doctor about it. He won't even talk to me about his pain. <laughs> He's a little stubborn. And then you have on the other extreme, people who may be dying at end of life with cancer-related pain, who have extreme excruciating pain, and everybody in between. It's a huge problem in society. We also know from the Institute of Medicine report on pain that it has an astounding cost to society. Over half a trillion dollars a year we spend each and every year on chronic pain. And while we put forward that pain can be a symptom of another condition, when it becomes persistent, when it becomes chronic, it can become a disease in and of its own right, one that fundamentally impacts just about every organ system in our body. And we're going to focus a lot today on the nervous system as one of those end organs. We know that chronic pain reduces quality of life and that throughout this entire country, and by the way, I recognize we're live streaming. There's a very U.S. centricity to this, this, this talk here with the IOM, but everything I'm saying here applies to every country on this planet. We know that pain is undertreated and that there's disparities in treatment with disparities across racial and ethnic groups, socioeconomic status, gender, age, and everything in between. And that despite these numbers that I'm throwing out to you, the one in three, the half a trillion dollars a year, I can tell you that the quality of the data that we have on pain is terrible. It's terrible. We put forward that we need better quality data to understand the actual prevalence of pain in this country, but more importantly, what treatments really work for whom and under what circumstances? For that, we still have a lot of questions. We had several underlying principles in the Institute of Medicine report on pain. One, and first and foremost, that pain management is a moral imperative for everyone who cares for somebody suffering in pain. That we recognize, particularly for complex painful conditions, that comprehensive treatment involving interdisciplinary teams, and we're going to talk more about the team sport aspect of pain. Dr. King will talk with you about that today. That we've learned in treating pain as a public health problem and other chronic diseases as public health problem that we're much better off preventing pain than we are treating it. If we can identify those people at risk before an injury or at surgery, we can often, we can work towards preventing them from going on to have chronic pain. We also learned that there is a lot of knowledge already out there. We know a lot about pain, and we need to do a better job in getting that knowledge out to you and the rest of the public. And that's in large part why we're here today, is to give back. The staff here, the faculty are all donating their time because they feel passionately about this issue, and they want to give back and help present education to all of you that you can use. We recognize this conundrum of opioids, this tension between, on one hand, these highly addictive substances that have caused overdose deaths, addiction, uh, diversion through people selling on the street and ending up in jail. And on the other hand, we have people whose lives have been transformed by opioids for the better and who are leading productive lives and working on a regular basis. And we recognize that there's no simple solution to this very complex problem. We're all going to have to come together and provide our own unique perspectives to this to find solutions, and that we all need to do better in collaboration, particularly collaborating with you. Collaborating with you is the key team player, and Dr. King again will talk about you as that MVP. And then circling back around to the fact that pain really is a public health crisis, and we need to treat it as such and apply public health approaches to it. We all know that pain has a multitude of negative consequences. People get emotional distress, they get depressed, anxious, they get angry. 
sleep all goes out of whack. And we're gonna have a great talk today on sleep. We're gonna be talking more about the role of emotional distress, and I'm gonna be talking in a few minutes about the role of the brain in all this. They get fatigued. We find fatigue plays a major role. And then what happens is people withdraw. You tend to withdraw from your friends, your family, and what you're gonna to learn today is that that withdrawal is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing when we have pain. All of this again leads to a decrease in quality of life, and many people are living with this condition without adequate care and suffer with often little sense of hope. And one of our goals here is to provide you some more hope. How big is this problem of chronic pain? Excuse me, how big is this problem of chronic back pain in the overall pot of chronic pain? Well, it's pretty darn big. It accounts for about 28% of all the chronic painful conditions, and if you add in neck pain, because the neck bone is connected to the backbone, it bumps up to about 43%. Huge problem in society. And just about everybody gets it. It was Benjamin Franklin who said, you know, there's two givens. There's two things that are certain in life, death and taxes. I'd like to add a third, back pain. They say by the date about 80% of people get back pain. I think the other 20% have either forgotten about it or are lying about it. <laughs> Everybody gets an episode of back pain. And the good news is, the good news is that about 90% of people will recover from that back pain episode after about one to three months. The bad news is about 10% of people after that episode or after a few of these episodes will go on to have chronic unremitting pain. And when taken together, back pain itself has a huge toll on society, upwards of 30 to $50 billion that are spent each year in the US alone. And the problem is getting worse. When you look at reports across primary care, what you're seeing is that over the years, we're seeing an increasing number of people coming to primary care doctors with a primary complaint of back pain. This makes sense, doesn't it? We have an aging population. We're living longer than we've ever lived before. We also have an increase in weight, which is putting increased load on our spine. We're also, as a consequence of living longer, we're doing this as a consequence because now we survive the surgeries that maybe we didn't in the past. We're surviving traumas because of good health care and um, emergency response teams. We're surviving wartime. Um, men and women coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, for instance. But we're now living with the chronic problem of pain as a consequence of that. And so what do we do about this? Well, the good news is there was a follow-up to the Institute of Medicine report on pain. The IOM report was a 30,000-foot 30 view of the world, where we needed to go with pain in this country. The National Pain Strategy, which was a document that was uh, charged by Health and Human Services, is a tactical plan. It's a plan on how we can get there. It was. We were charged, I was uh, honored to co-chair this with Dr. Linda Porter from the National Institutes of Health and as well as 80 uh, incredibly talented and uh, passionate experts in the area of pain across the country to develop a comprehensive population health strategy for pain prevention, treatment, management, education, reimbursement, and research. And this plan had very specific goals, actions, timeframes, resources, and also it had accountability. And it was released in March of this year. And this is a summary of the National Pain Strategy. It encompassed six working groups that cross-cut all aspects of what we need to do to transform this country. Starting with population research here, where we recognize that the quality of the data is poor. We need better quality data, but we also need to use that data more effectively. We're working on that extensively here at Stanford to better understand each and every person who comes into our clinic and then ultimately to figure out what works for whom and under what circumstance to help obtain the mission of what President Obama has called for in precision medicine, what our dean has called for here at Stanford in precision health. Prevention and care, which is to increase access to quality care to better communicate and understand what treatments work which and let's use them and what treatments don't work. Also to better extend self-management programs and to come up with standardized ways of approaching people with pain. I'll tell you right now that for those of you with back pain, if you go to 10 different docs uh, who are experts at back pain and get an assessment, you're gonna get 10 entirely different assessments. We don't have standardized models for this right now. We need to do better. There are clear disparities in the way we care for people with pain. There are, uh, as I mentioned before, ethnic, social, 
uh, economic status, there's gender, there's age differences, and we need to break down those barriers. We also need to do a better job in how we reimburse for the care of the treatment of pain. Right now, we often spend money for things that don't work, and we don't spend money for things that do. We need to do a better job in educating our clinicians, those who care for people with pain across every level of their training from you know, early schooling to people who are out for 20 or 40 years. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, we need to do a better job in educating the public, educating the public about the importance of this condition, this disease, as well as, part of that, a message around safe opioid prescribing and safe opioid use. We do recognize there is a prescription opioid epidemic, and we need to get the message out that your medications are your medications. We need to keep them safe and use them safely. Now, if we can successfully enact this, what will this mean? Well, what it'll mean is that uh, ultimately we'll treat chronic pain as the chronic disease that we know it to be that will treat it as a public health crisis that we know that it is. And as such, we will put in the appropriate resources to be able to provide you with access to the quality of care that you deserve, to develop better self-management approaches that you can use at home to better and more effectively manage your pain. And that ultimately, that you'll be treated with the compassion and respect that you deserve. So what can you all do? What can we all do? Well, one is we can put pressure on the Fed. You know, talk with your representatives uh, in Congress. Let them know the importance of the national pain strategy. Download it, read it. It's only about 40 pages. It's an easy read. It's freely available. Get the message out. If you are uh, uh, interested in working with some of the consumer pain groups, please reach out to them. One, uh, a number of them have banded together under the Consumer Pain Action Task Force, the CPATF. They've brought 16 of these together to promote the national pain strategy. They'd love to have you involved. If you're somebody of means, we'd love to have you help with your resources. If you're somebody who knows how to get the media messages out, help us there. It's really all going to take all of us working together to get that cultural transformation that we all need in the care, assessment, and prevention of pain. Thank you.